Okay, I am back for another video. I'm still stalling and doing more concepts until about June 1st-ish, but uh, today is actually a pretty important topic, which is going to be Apache Spark. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so Spark, what is it? Spark is basically another um, open source batch processing framework that was invented by a bunch of researchers at UC Berkeley, I think around 10 years ago. It's an example of a data flow engine and it is capable of providing major performance increases over something that is a more naive implementation of batch processing like MapReduce. So let's go ahead and talk about how it's able to do this and explain all of that. So what are the problems of MapReduce? This is kind of like a throwback to an older video. If you recall, MapReduce is really bad for iterative jobs or any jobs that are chaining together a bunch of map and reduces. Uh, for example, page rank. So you know, if you're, if you're iterating over some for loop and basically making adjustments to, I don't know, maybe a set of nodes in a graph or anything like that, MapReduce is really poor for that. So why is this? Well, for starters, MapReduce materializes intermediary state. What that means is that you're doing a ton of disk reads and writes every single time that you do an actual MapReduce job because both inputs and outputs of MapReduce are all going to be written to the underlying file store, which means that you're doing tons of writes to the disk. And the truth is, the majority of the time, we don't really care about the intermediate writes. We just care about the end result. In addition to that, um, generally speaking, when we're doing MapReduce, the first time, mappers are useful. But after that, generally, we only care about reducing. The thing is, though, that we have all these unnecessary sorts and kind of repartitions, and a lot of the time, it's not necessary, and it just wastes a ton of computation. So Spark provides us with a lot more flexibility by just allowing you to define operators and give you a more free form, just you know, write some code, and we're going to make it happen in a parallelized type of way. But let's go into some more detail. So like I mentioned, the big issue with MapReduce was uh, manifesting this intermediate state and so what Spark chooses to do instead is implement something called RDDs or resilient distributed data sets. So basically these are just going to be in memory data structures where their lineage is tracked and they represent the contents of some Spark variable. So that variable is originally probably going to be gotten from HDFS or whatever the underlying data store is and then you can do transformations on an RDD in order to go ahead and derive other RDDs. So by going and mapping out this data flow we're able to actually get a really efficient system going where the majority of the data is actually kept in memory assuming they can fit there and then that way we don't have to go ahead and materialize everything. So Let's talk about fault tolerance, because basically what I base, uh, just said is that Spark does a bunch of computations, but it goes ahead and just keeps them in memory. And so the, kind of the important thing here, though, is if things are being kept in memory and we're running these huge computations, aren't nodes going to be failing all the time and then losing that data? Um, so yes, nodes are going to be failing all the time and losing data, but Spark kind of uses um, these dependencies or the the graph of lineages for each RDD in order to kind of make good decisions about fault tolerance and how to handle things. So generally speaking, what Spark tends to do is instead of storing all of the computation at every single step in a persistent manner, it stores computation sometimes and then goes ahead and recomputes it when need be. So let's look at two situations basically of failures where Spark has to go ahead and recompute data. So the first one is called a narrow dependency. So imagine we have these three nodes right here, and the first thing that I'm going to do is basically just a map job. We've got all this data for uh, browser history partitioned by the date that it actually happened, and the only thing I'm first going to do is go ahead and map that browser data from uh, you know URL date tuple to just the URL. So that's just going to be called a narrow dependency. The reason for this is that there's no inter-node uh, communication. The node is doing all this computation locally only for the data that it's storing in its actual underlying hard drive. So now imagine if node 3 were to fail. So basically what would happen is that if node 3 failed, we know that node 1 and node 2 can basically just take some extra load from what should have been node 3's data and then go ahead and calculate it itself. The reason for this is that um, node 3 was making those computations completely independently of what node 1 and node 2 were doing and so as a result by splitting up node 3's computation between node 1 and node 2 we're able to kind of parallelize that fault and go ahead and quickly recompute it. 
However, this gets a lot more complex when there's um, you know, greater interleaving between the actual data dependencies, and we'll see that in the case of something where we're grouping together by key. So this is known as a wide dependency. So imagine instead of just taking all of these URLs together and um, you know, removing the dates from them, that in addition we did something where we grouped by key and put every you know, unique key on a single node. So as you can see, we have all three URLs for Jordan, Donald, and Joe, each on a node. And those are each coming from node 1, node 2, and node 3. And this is a very common thing that happens in both MapReduce and just any type of Spark job, because generally speaking, you want similar keys together. Um, like I said, this is known as a wide dependency. So imagine the case where node 3 actually fails here. This is going to be a little bit tougher to recover from for the following reason. So if node 3 fails, we see that the final state of node 3 was basically all these URLs for Joe. And so in order to go ahead and recompute all of that, we can't actually go ahead and just basically say, um, OK, let's go ahead and parallelize the computation of node 3 over the remaining nodes that are still alive in the cluster. The reason for this being that we still have all this over the network communication that needs to happen in order to end up materializing that final state. So simply parallelizing things isn't going to work. You basically have to go back from the start and just recompute everything before that wide dependency and then go ahead and do the wide dependency again. So this is really inefficient when this happens, when there's a wide de uh, dependency, and it kind of begs the question of, okay, okay well, how can we you know, do better here and actually make it such that um, you know, we don't have to go ahead and recompute everything? Well, the answer to this is basically checkpointing. Um, I've mentioned checkpointing in the past, but all it really does is take you know, the given state of a system and go ahead and save that to some sort of persistent data, uh, data store, like, I don't know, HDFS in this case, assuming that's what you're running Spark on. So what we would actually do is, you know, assuming node 3 was still alive and we had this data at one point where we have um, the, those final states of node 1, node 2, and node 3, and we knew that we were going to be doing more with it, but we didn't want to potentially run the risk of, you know, one of these nodes crashing and then having to recompute everything all over again. What we would do is actually go ahead and checkpoint the result of this wide dependency or this join. And as a result of that, if node 3 were to ever crash, we could go ahead and just access HDFS and use that checkpoint to kind of reestablish a new node that's taking over the data of what node 3 had. And then that way, we're able to kind of quickly recover from that fault as opposed to having to recompute every single thing. So this is kind of how Spark tends to suggest that you handle wide dependencies. And for narrow dependencies, like I mentioned, it's not really a huge deal if one node fails because you can go ahead and parallelize all that computation over the other nodes. But generally speaking, for handling wide dependencies, you want to be checkpointing. Okay, so in conclusion, basically Spark is able to provide huge performance gains over MapReduce by declining to materialize intermediate state every single time there's an operation. And by doing so, there are some slight trade-offs in the sense that Spark is going to be more expensive by making you use more RAM because you're storing all these RDDs in memory. And in addition, there is going to be slightly worse fault tolerance. Recall that MapReduce was kind of actually built to be super fault tolerant because Google was constantly preempting those jobs. That being said, it's pretty clear, I guess, in industry that Spark is much more widely used these days. And I would imagine that's probably just because of the huge speed increases that it leads to. So as a result, guys, I hope you understand now a little bit more about these data flow engines and kind of the motivation behind using Spark over something like MapReduce. In practice, a lot of these batch jobs are literally gigantic and have tons of data, and you have to chain together a ton of functions. And so MapReduce becomes pretty infeasible. All of those disk writes just don't make sense. OK, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll be uh, hopefully doing another one tomorrow.